today we're going to talk about Texas, and we're going to talk about Texas War for Independence, a little bit about the Republic, but I thought we'd start off with just a few facts about Texas, because as Ann Walton reminds me, she says at least once a week she wins at Jeopardy because of some obscure fact that I told her at at some point in one of the many history classes that we shared together because I've always liked odd facts and kids tend to like those odd facts. So, you know, I thought we'd start off with two or three of those things today. One of them is that of the 50 states, Texas is the second largest. Um, I think most people maybe sometimes even think Texas is the largest, but Alaska has more square miles. Texas has about 270,000 square miles. And to give you an idea of relative size, Tennessee has about 41,000 square miles. So Texas is five times the size of Tennessee. It has the second largest population in the union, second only to California. And I think most of us know that because especially during presidential elections when we're following the electoral college and looking at those votes, one of the reasons Truly, you know, however you feel politically, one of the reasons that the founding fathers in their wisdom created the Electoral College was they were, they had enough forethought to realize because of what they'd seen at the Continental um, Congresses and especially during the Constitutional Conventions to realize that if ever it just simply went on population and on land mass that the little states would disappear and would become nothing but dangling participles to the union. Um, so Texas is always up there in those, those most important states when it comes to electoral votes. Uh, Texas is the only state in the union, and we'll talk about this when, and when we talk about them coming into the union in 1845, but Texas is the only state in the union which is allowed to fly its state flag at the same level of the, ten, of the U.S. flag. Every other flag has to be lower than the US flag to acknowledge the federal system where we are a sovereign nation of sovereign states, but the sovereign nation being that strong point of contention. Texas, because they had been their, their own independent country, negotiated a clause when they came into the union in 1845, um, actually under John Tyler, but James K. Polk is the one who announced that he would admit them to the union and that's why they went ahead and did it even before he was sworn in. But they negotiated a clause that they could fly their flag at the same height as the US flag. It still annoys me, I will tell you, to no end. The occasional times, most of the time they don't do it. When they do, if you hear a loud hissing sound coming from Southeast Tennessee, it's mine. It annoys me, I, I believe, you know, in an honor guard, the American flag always stays upright, the state flags and other flags dip in reverence to the union and being a good unionist here, it annoys me that tax, Texas does that sometimes, but they do other things that annoy me sometimes. They are probably most famous for having had the six flags that flew over them. And you know, now we think of six flags amusement parks everywhere, but that actually began in Texas. And it was a unique way of sort of pointing to their heritage, the fact that they had been Spanish, French, um, let me make sure I get them in the right order. Spanish, France, Mexican, the Republic of Texas, the United States, and then the Confederacy being the sixth flag that had flown over them as a nation. Uh, one of the other things that's kind of interesting is that two of our U.S. presidents were born in Texas and neither one of them was, the last name was Bush. Um, Bush 41, of course, was, was born in um, Kennebunkport, Maine, and Bush 43, was also not born in Texas. He was born while his, his father was a student at Princeton. The two presidents who were born in Texas were Eisenhower, whose father was posted to Texas. And then of course, Lyndon Johnson, who was almost always bigger than Texas itself, uh, personality wise, politically in every sort of way. For those of you that follow politics and for those of you that are young, I always find it interesting because Texas was staunchly democratic from the time of the American Civil War. The first time they elected a Republican Senator was in 1961 when they elected John Tower to take Lyndon Johnson's seat in the Senate because Johnson was had been elected as Vice President. They didn't re elect a Republican governor uh, until 1989. And today we think of them as being staunchly Republican, but that's not their historical background at all. And 
the, the last thing that I thought you might find interesting is when they were admitted to the union and, and it was a really sort of a political ploy on the part of the South that was able to do this, when they were admitted to the union, there was an agreement that Texas could in theory be divided into five states. If the population increased significantly, they could become five separate states, uh, dividing them up. Yeah. They chose never to do that. They enjoyed their, their precedent as being such a large land mass and eventually a large population center also. Right. So they, they remain our largest of the contiguous 48 states. So let's talk a little bit about Texas independence. I think probably if you stopped I hesitate to say this. I sort of say, if you stop anybody on the streets and you said, remember the Alamo, I think they would know the Alamo, but I wonder about that sometimes now because every so often I will say something that I think is probably common knowledge only to, to be reminded that it's not because we don't, you know, one thing history keeps expanding and the amount of time in which we're allowed to teach it in the schools doesn't expand. So you have to kind of rush through everything. You know, I used to tell folks I did the countdown to the Civil War. I did the entire Civil War in two days and then I did the ramifications of the Civil War because those were really what was most politically important even though I wanted to wallow in Antietam and Gettysburg and you know all the battles of the Civil War and I wanted to do St. Mary's Heights and Chamberlain and the Irish Brigade. I usually found that I was the only one who was terribly, terribly interested in those sorts of facts. So, so we're gonna talk a little bit today about the Texas War for Independence, how it all came to be, and then a little bit about the Republic of Texas and then how it becomes a state. And we will cover all of that, what really amounts to about 30 years of history in 35 minutes or so, which is certainly doable because we do those sorts of things on a regular basis. Um, you know, you think about Texas and, and for those of you who love to travel, you know, Texas is sort of a microcosm of the entire United States because you have the, you know, the Cherokee Lake and, and the rolling hills of central Texas, you know, Fredericksburg, you know, the blue bonnets everywhere. And then you have West Texas, which sort of looks like alien space, um, oil country, desolate. You have San Antonio with the rich Hispanic culture all the way to Northern Texas, where it's hard to distinguish between Texas and Oklahoma or Missouri or any of those states that are anywhere nearby because it seems in some ways, even like Tennessee, if you're up around Wahatchee and, and some of those areas. Um, if we think about specifically the Texas War for Independence, it begins in October of 1835 with a battle that really the majority of people have never heard of, and that's the Battle of Gonzales. And it ends in 1836 in April with the Battle of San Jacinto, which is outside of Houston. Huge battlefield there, wonderful monuments and everything. You know, you need to plan a trip or if we ever get our bus trip together, we'll sort of hit, especially the Alamo, Goliad and San Jacinto, we'll have to hit those. Um, you know, the revolution itself, you'll see lasts for only about eight months. But the truth of the matter is the revolution had been fermenting probably back to the earliest <clears throat> um, influx of, of American settlers into the region. And that's about 1815 to about 1821. When you have the Mexican government concerned about the fact that what is Texas and the majority of the people who were living in Texas at that point were Native Americans. And I think most people don't know that. There were about 15 to 20,000 Cherokee that were already in Texas by 1820. And in addition to that, you have a lesser number of Mexican settlers who are up in the Texas region. They are Tejanos, that means Mexican, but living in Texas. And there was some concern in the Mexican government about what would happen if the Indians were to revolt and there was to be Indian warfare on the frontier and, and would Mexico lose all of that land? And that's when the invitation went out uh, inviting U.S. settlers to come into Texas, promising them land. It was good land for the growth of cotton and, and particularly those sorts of crops, cattle, and cattle was just beginning. Cattle was an expensive investment for farming. 
because you had had to ha start off with a good sized herd to then be able to replenish the herd and sell off the old cattle and all those sorts of things. So they begin to entice settlers to come into the region. And of course, I, we have mentioned before in talking about these classes, Moses Austin and Stephen Austin who come out of Virginia, travel across the Southeast, pick up a whole bunch of folks in Tennessee. In fact, probably among those of us watching today, we have ancestors who went there, but it was the Cortez or the ruling assembly, the, the legislative assembly in Mexico that offered these grants if people would come in and they offered them under what will eventually be codified or written into law in the 1824 Mexican constitution. And it basically said that anyone coming could get land, um, that they would immediately become citizens of the region, that the Mexican government would honor their independence, would allow them a certain amount of control regionally. There would be regional assemblies, um, not in the same way in which we think of legislative assemblies, but local control by, by landowners getting together and deciding rules and everything. Um, and there was a, a clause in there that said that if you came, you had to become Roman Catholic, but no one was riding around and policing that. And the truth of the matter is that about 90% of the immigrants who moved to Texas were not Catholic and had no particular interest in becoming Catholic. You know, the, the Southeastern United States as a rule tends to be predominantly Scotch-Irish, you know, some German, some Swiss, not as many Catholic as you might find in the mid-Atlantic states. Now, if you get into South Carolina and Georgia, you'll find more who maybe were Catholic, but the majority of the people who are going to Texas are not Catholic and not aren't particularly interested in converting. The problem occurs when in April of 1830, the Mexican government begins to look at that Texas region and to realize that a lot of those Southeastern settlers and the Cherokee have a lot in common. They are not, you know, they're thinking that if they invite the Americans, the Southeastern U.S folks into Texas that they will be at bay with the Cherokee. And while the Cherokee certainly simultaneously are not being treated very well back here in the Carolinas, in Tennessee, in Georgia, because the Cherokee were agrarian, they were farmers, they were herders, they were not, you know, plains warriors, they were not the Sioux, uh, they were not the Apache, uh, any of the Western tribes there wasn't a natural tension between them. And in 1830, the Mexican government passes a rule that says, no more Americans can come into the region. Done, We're th we've got all we want. The rest of you stay home. You didn't get here quickly enough. Um, they also said that there would be no more slaves. So if you were already living in Texas, you couldn't bring slaves in. They're very leery. They're not, they don't know exactly how to figure out how this slave quota might happen if there was to ever be a revolution. And they're going to start enforcing Catholicism. <coughs> now the American, the US citizens, US settlers who are in Texas are really not too worried about the Catholicism because how, how do you enforce that? You, know, you can't be around people all the time. Um, the English found that out during the time of the wars with Henry VIII and Mary, his daughter and all of that. What they really are concerned about is that the Mexican government in 1830 does away with all regional authority and military law is going to be instituted. American citizens, even in the 1820s and the 1830s, the idea of military law versus civilian law is a real catching point. You know, we, we have that aversion, that idea of military commanders, quartering of troops, all those sorts of things that were part of our reason for the revolution. Well, Santa Ana seizes control of the government in 1830, and he begins to talk about liberalizing. He's going to uh, have a written constitution. He maybe is going to give those who are living in Texas, the Tejanos, the Mexicans living there, the U.S. immigrants, and the Cherokee we're going to kind of ignore because they're not considered to be citizens really of the region. But he's talking about maybe having some, um, allowing them to have more rights. 
But he begins to read the handwriting on the wall and realizes that in trying to hold Mexico together, it's the 1830s, you know, they've gained their independence in the eight, in early 1820s with Father Hidalgo. And Mexico is a vast land itself with a lot of different cultures. There's a lot of, of native peoples um, from that area of, of Central America. There are also mestizos, mixed blood. You know, there are those who are Castilian, Spanish descent. There are those that you know, there's just so much going on. So he decides that maybe he can't be quite as liberal as he wanted to be. Liberalism doesn't work well if you really like to be in charge. And as he begins to deny grievances from those who are living in Texas, the Texans get a little frustrating. So the Texans decide to do what, as American citizens, they probably would have done. And they decide to call a convention. It's almost like a second Continental Congress sort of gathering. They ask each of the areas within where they have settled, what would today be Texas, primarily north really of the Nisus River, Nusas River, uh, some from between the Nusas and the Rio Grande. But anyway, everybody's to send representatives and they're all going to get together. And what they do is they get together and they come up with a list of grievances. <laughs> and they, um, what they want is for the Mexican government to recognize them as their own Mexican state. So you have to think that Mexico is divided into states, Chihuahua, Yucatan, you know, there are multiple states all across. And Texas was not its own independent state. It was um, joined in with a, another, a northern, Texas, uh, northern Mexican province. Texas wants to be its own province. It wants to have trial by jury. There had been a couple of situations that happened in, in early 1830 in which Texans had been arrested and they had been tried by military tribunals and had been executed. I mean, that's just not how we do things in this country. And even though they weren't in this country, they really hold true to that concept of innocent until proven guilty. You know, you get to have a defense, trial by jury, all those sorts of things. The other thing that was really annoying them was that anything they grew in, in their land in Texas, but if they took it into Mexico proper across the Rio Grande into Mexico to sell, they had to pay a tariff on. And they didn't like that idea at all. So they come up with this list of grievances. Those are probably the three biggest of them. The attendees all sign the grievances and Stephen Austin agrees that he will hand deliver them to Mexico. You know, I. I'm kind of in the back of my mind decided Stephen Austin likes to travel. You know, who wants to go to Mexico City and deliver this? Well, he's a, certainly the most recognizable name, but it has to beat the heck out of staying home and plowing is all I'm going to say. You know, I always tell people maybe that's why the Tennesseans volunteered so often in the war was stay home with the wife and 11 children planting crops or I can go seek my fortune and adventure and fight in a war. Well, maybe that's it. So Stephen Austin takes the petition, goes to Mexico City. He presents it. Santa Ana now is not just militarily in charge of Mexico, but he has been elected in a free election, emphasis on free. He has been elected president of Mexico and Stephen Austin delivers the petition to him and to this legislative body that really isn't functioning any longer. And he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and he's there for several weeks, and nobody does anything. I mean, they don't come back and say, Stephen, you got rocks in your head. No way we're going to do this. They just ignore him. And being a good former citizen of the United States, he decides that he will force them to take some sort of action. So he writes a letter that will be publicly circulated around Mexico and will go to the Mexican newspapers, <laughs> which does not make Santa Ana very happy with him. In fact, you know, in, in the newspaper articles, what he basically says is he advocates statehood for Texas, statehood as in a, a proper state or province within Mexico, and a certain amount of limited local home rule. And Santa Ana is really angry and orders him to be arrested. Now, in the meantime, Stephen, Stephen is not stupid. Stephen writes his letter, circulates it, sends it to the newspapers, and he heads back to Texas. 
The Mexican army intercedes with him before he can get back into Texas and they, they follow through on the order for arrest. He will be taken back to Mexico City and he will remain in jail for 18 months. 18 months he's in jail. Well, Santa Ana you know, is sort of tenuously in control of the government. Texas now is really, the citizens in Texas are upset because Stephen Austin is in jail in Mexico City. They can't get any sort of movement on their request for statehood. They can't find out what's going on with Stephen. Santa Ana is in a precarious situation and he is removed from power for just a short period of time. In the meantime, the Mexican government sends this guy by the name of Juan Almonte to Texas to do sort of basically an eyes and ears for the Mexican government about what the heck is going on in Texas? What are those people up to? Why do they wanna be their own state? Are they a threat to our security? You know, are they, what are they? What are they doing? He goes, spends almost a year um, surveying Texas, riding around incognito, which I think is hilarious because of, according to all the records, everybody knew who he was. He thought he was being real cool. But anyway, he comes back and he says that the settlements appear to be prosperous and that for the most part, he didn't detect that there was a lot of, and his quote is unrest or disloyalty as much as there just was this thirst for independence that seemed to be something that the Americans seemed to, to be really interested in. So at least he's sort of aware of that. Um, he also says in his report, he doesn't believe that there's any threat of revolution, that if they were to be made their own independent state, that would take care of it. And it looks like there's a movement toward that. But in 1835, you know, at the end of like March of 1835, February of 1835, uh, Santa Ana comes back into power. And when he does, he sees his power this time as an absolutist dictator. He moves to abolish all forms of, of representative government. All of the people who will be in charge of the territorial provinces will be military governors who are in charge and they will all be under the direct command of Santa Ana. He is totally 100% in control as a dictator. Now, what we in the United States don't realize is, is that the revolution, this wave of revolution doesn't really start in Texas. Several of the Mexican states revolt when this happens. They're not particularly interested in military dictatorship either. They're not interested in having, you know, all semblance. They fought a revolution just 15 years earlier for independence and that independence was to mean some control at the local level. Uh, they're not anxious to see that disappear. Santa Ana, as, in, as different of the Mexican states begin to revolt, Santa Ana becomes ruthless in the military reprisals. In the Yucatan in particular, Santa Ana, in his decrees, <coughs> identifies those who live in the Yucatan as being less than human because for the most part, they are indigenous people or they are of mixed race. And he sends the military into the Yucatan with the order that anyone who refuses the military control is simply to be executed. That, that spreads to other areas across Mexico too. And Monclava, some of the other regions, ultimately it does reach Texas, but Texas is about the sixth province to begin to revolt. Um, when that happens, the Texans are alarmed because one is they begin to realize the military is going to be in control. They begin to figure out how do they organize themselves and drawing on their rich history as descendants of American citizens, they begin to put together their own local community militia units, kind of like Minutemen in the same way that we did during the American Revolution. And they also send the word out that they feel as though they are going to be under siege by the Mexican military. And remember again, it's not the Mexican people that they are waging war against, it is the Mexican military. So the word goes out across the Southeast and from all across the Southeast come people to Texas to help the Texans if indeed it's gonna come down to some sort of a defense. Remember 
they don't see themselves in revolt as much as they are going to defend themselves against this imposition of military control. Um, when they do that and, and people began arriving by about March, April of 1835 into the Texas territory, then you're going to have the Mexican army sending reinforcements to San Antonio. And before the troops can get all the way to San, San Antonio, because it's a bit of a distance from Mexico City, what you have is Colonel William Travis who sends the word out that the Mexican army has to be stopped at San Antonio. Um, and you can see where this is going. So he sends the word out and he begins to assemble men who will help him stop the Mexican army at San Antonio. Two reasons. One, if they can defeat the army at San Antonio, the Mexican army will retreat to Mexico. If they cannot defeat them, then perhaps they can delay them long enough for the other communities and areas within Texas to get their men together and be ready to fight if the Mexican army keeps coming deeper and deeper into Texas. Um, when he issues that request for people to come to San Antonio, for men to come to San Antonio and help him, the Mexican government actually issues a bounty on the heads for, of, of Travis and other key leaders. Um, Three-Legged Willie, who is you know, a, a famous kind of frontier fighter who's part of that group. So the Mexican government puts out a bounty to capture these men so that they can't mount an attack. So where are we going from there? Well, you know, Austin by now, he's gotten out of, of jail in Texas. He's on his way back to Mexico. He gets back to Mexico. And as they are preparing for this potential fight, they also begin to talk about, well, what happens if we were to become independent? You know, what, what do we want? What do we look like? What is it that we envision ourselves being? So they, they put together this central committee of San Felipe, which is going to sort of look at if we were to draft an independent statement, if we were to draft a constitution, what would it look like? They put Stephen Austin in charge of that committee. In the meantime, the military in Texas, the, the individual citizens, many of whom have, have come from the United States are beginning to put things together as to how they will respond. Um, when Mexico hears that the Central Committee of San Felipe has been created and that they're looking at potentially declaring independence, they then order a total military occupation of all the land of Texas. The Me a Mexican general by the name of Coase lands 500 men at uh, Capano Bay and then they begin to march towards San Antonio. Austin again in a letter that goes to the US government and goes to the communities throughout Texas says, and this is his quote, war is our only resource. War is our only resource if we are going to have 100% total military occupation. And he asked for more men to begin to form units to create resistance. First clash occurs at Gonzales, which is on the Guadalupe River. Uh, Mexican forces, uh, the story is actually kind of funny, if ever a battle can be funny. So Gonzales is a little bitty tiny town and Gonzales has a, has a cannon and the cannon had been given to them by the Mexican government several decades earlier because they're on, they kind of have a hill and they are there on the Guadalupe River. They've been given this cannon and they were told to keep the cannon and keep it focused on the river. And if ever was, there was to be an invasion of Mexico that came along the Guadalupe River, then the city of Gonzales, the town of Gonzales, because there are only several hundred people there, are to use their cannon to fire on the invaders. So they have this cannon and they polish this cannon and they have a little ceremony every year. And, you know, it's the, the, the day of the cannon. The cannon's painted white. I mean, it's a, it's a big whoopee. Uh, the idea being that if they were ever to be invaded, they would probably be invaded by the Indians. The Cherokee might have messed with some of the other southeastern tribes, southwestern tribes, and try and take the territory. So the Mexican army, <clears throat> this force of about 500, gets to Gonzales, and they send a message to Gonzales that says, basically, give us your cannon. And Gonzales refuses. 
Well, they send, they, they wait a few hours and then they send another message that says, give us your cabin. And Gonzalez does not respond this time. Instead, what they do is they put the cannon up on top of the hill. They make a big sign and um, a group of men that are gonna be led by two folks that probably Texas history, John Henry Moore and Joseph Wallace, who will later be prominent in Texas history are there and they make this huge sign out of a bed sheet and on it, they paint a message that says, come and take it. I mean, for a moment, I, whenever I think of this, I think of Charlie Coolidge in France in 1944 saying to the German tanks, you'll have to come get me, buddy. It's the same sort of thing. So imagine this little bitty cannon and this great big bed sheet sign that says, come and take it. But And the, the Mexican military tries to come and take it. And the reality is that at Gonzales, ultimately the, the Mexicans will be victorious, but it's the first clash, but they use their cannon and they take out a number of the Mexicans. Um, at the same time, you're ultimately the Mexican army is going to withdraw their, the, the folks in Gonzales lose one person. The Mexican forces retreat. It's the first battle of the Texas war for independence and they're big on this, come and take it. That becomes their battle cry until they get a better, better battle cry, which they're gonna do pretty shortly. So real quickly, so why, why does the war even occur? I always used to love to ask my students that, you know, you have to think pretty seriously, unless you're some sort of a sociopath or you just enjoy war. And I've not ever really known anyone who had ever seen the face of war that loved war. Uh, there have to be motivating factors for you to go to war. And historians have argued now for you know 180 years as to why the war for independence occurs, 185 years, I guess. You know, was it economics? Was it because there was land, cheap land, speculation, um, the chance to become wealthy with agrarian crops, all those sorts of things, probably. Was there a cultural clash? Maybe there are those who say, well, you know, the, the US settlers in Texas thought themselves superior to the Mexicans. They saw themselves as a superior race of people over the Mexican people. Maybe, but you don't find a lot of that in the writing. Now, there's a cultural class of lang clash of language, faith, custom, but you don't find a, a lot of writing that centers more on bigotry and those sorts of things at that point in Texas. Um, more than anything, the cultural class probably was over the idea of military rule. It's not uncommon within Spanish culture for military junta, for military rule. That's not something that predominantly English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh uh, descendants. We, we don't like the military telling us what to do. We want to be in control over the military always. Uh, was it because there was instability in the government? Probably. You know, there's always, if there's instability, something comes into the void. And if there's weakness at the top, somebody strong will try to seize power. Was that Stephen Austin? Maybe, except that he's not interested in having a lot of power when the, the independence movement is over. So there's just a lot of complex issues. Um, what we do know is that after the battle occurs at Gonzales, you know, the Texans kind of look at each other and go, well, shucky darn, it looks like we're about to have a fight. You know, they, these people are, this, the Mexican military is coming for us. We need to be prepared to fight with them. So they do get together. March the 1st, 1836, they write a constitution at a little settlement called Washington on the Brazos, and they declare their independence. At the time that they're doing that, there's still an argument over, is that truly when they became independent or did they become independent after the Battle of San Jacinto? I will tell you that the folks who live in Washington on the Brazos, that's the day for independence. So March the 1st, 1836. Um, the Mexican army, when they hear that, Santa Ana is just incensed that they would uh, even consider to declare themselves independent. So the Mexican army starts moving towards San Antonio with about 9,000 troops. That's a significant number of people to be moving into the Texas area. Um, 
I think all of us know that the next major battle, now there are a whole bunch of skirmishes, you know, there's the Battle of the Tall Grasses, there's the Battle of the Low Pines, you know, I, I love all the frontier battle names, but the next major battle that will occur is actually an assault, which occurs at the Alamo on March the 6th of 1836, that's five days after they have declared independence. Um, Santa Ana and the, they lay siege to the Alamo, which is, was at that point, of course, a mission, a uh, chapel inside and a mission to the people in the region. Santa Ana issues what is called a deguelo. And uh, that means basically uh, it's a bugle sound before you begin a battle that says there will be no enemy taken alive. It is a command from the general in charge that all must die. Everyone will be killed. There will be, we're not gonna take anyone as a living survivor. From the moment the siege begins within one hour, all 189 men, and there's a debate on the number of people who were in the Alamo, but it, 189 seems to be the best historical record. Within one hour, all 189 men have perished. Among them, of course, are names that, that we still talk about in history today. Travis, who had stepped forward so gallantly at the beginning to begin to assemble the troops. Bowie, you know, the famous Bowie knife, but who had been, you know, the frontier fighter, um, will die there. Crockett, and there are stories that Crockett died immediately. There are stories that have circulated that said Crockett was taken captive and then would later be executed in front of a large group of troops, sort of as a bounty of the war, because to take Crockett, the most famous of all the fighters, would be sort of the great thing to do. Um, Bonham, some of the others that are, are really famous, but they will all be executed and will be killed, all of them. Um, Santa Ana loses about 600 men, about 25% of his forces will die, which if you think about it, a 25% casualty rate in any battle is just unbelievable. I mean, we, we don't fight battles with those kind of casualty rates. Those become almost massacres. Um, there were several women present who are allowed to live and they are allowed to live under the condition they will be released from the uh, mission sent in wagons to take a message to Sam Houston, who when they had signed that Declaration of Independence on March the 1st, Sam Houston had been named commander in chief of the, of the revolutionary forces. So they're to take a message to Houston and to tell him what happened. You know, I, I sometimes wonder what Santa Ana was thinking. Was he thinking that when they realized how quickly the Alamo fell, but remember the Alamo had few men, you know, you were talking about 9,000 troops versus less than 200 men. They don't have a lot of supplies. They're running low on water. You know, did he think that Houston would go, oh my goodness, we can't possibly defeat them. We're just gonna call this whole thing off. Did he not anticipate what the fall of the Alamo and the massacre as it will be considered of all those, you know, in chivalry and battle demands that you pay homage to those who fought, fought valiantly against you and that's not what happens. Well, anyway, remember the Alamo becomes the battle cry. Um, and it, even today, you know, you can say remember the Alamo and most people do indeed know what you're thinking about. So Houston begins to talk about we know now what the Mexican army is capable of doing. We know now, you know, that they're going to do whatever they have to to try and keep this land and to expose the people who are living here. They're going to place us under military control. We're going to wage war and the Texans begin to wage war. There are two other battles that you sort of need to know and then we'll be at a point we can sort of stop and talk a little bit about the Republic of Texas. The Battle of Goliad and Goliad is more central Texas. Um, when we do our bus tour, we'll go by there. It's one of my favorite sites to go to. At Goliad, the Texans are once again terribly outnumbered and they finally, Colonel Fannin, James Fannin, who is the leader of the Texas troops at Goliad, finally realizes he has to surrender, otherwise his men are simply gonna be slaughtered. They are so outnumbered. And so under the white flag, the Texas forces at Goliad surrender and Santa Ana offers them terms of surrender, including that they will all be, 
they will be taken captive, but they will be treated fairly. And at some point in the future, they will be released. You know, all those nice things that you say to each other. That's not what happens. Um, within about three days, all the men who have been captured at Goliad are marched out of the cells. There are a few that have escaped, but they are marched out of actually the barricade, like a stockade where they're being held. They are ordered to kneel and they are executed by Mexican firing squads. They're, and it's remembered as the massacre at Goliad. Having surrendered under that historic white flag, which guarantees safety for those who have surrendered, they all, will all be summarily executed. Um, when the word gets out from those who have escaped and have gotten back as to what happened at Goliad, then the battle cry becomes, remember the Alamo, remember Goliad. Final major occurrence. When that happens, Texas declares itself to be the Republic of Texas and Sam Houston is now not just the commander in chief of the Texas Revolutionary Forces, he is the first president of the Texas, the Republic of Texas. Um, now the truth of the matter is, is that Sam Houston knows they still have a really, what has the potential to be a really difficult fight because they don't have a lot of supplies. They don't have nearly enough men compared to what the Mexican army has and to the supplies. But what happens is, is that Sam Houston, who is a good frontier fighter, you know, he's been trained not only had he been involved in the War of 1812, not only had he spent two years with Chief Jolly up here in the Tennessee River at Hiawassee on the island at Hiawassee, being trained in Cherokee techniques, knowing how to, to track, but Houston is able to determine that Santa Ana's army has moved towards San Jacinto. He's able to track them. And he and his men will surprise the Mexican army at San Jacinto and will defeat them because they have surprised them. His greatest accomplishment, he will always say, is that Santa Ana, the president of Mexico, the general of the Mexican army, will be captured cowering in tall grass to the side of the battlefield, and he has put on the uniform of one of his regular corps members. He's not wearing his general's uniform. Houston will use that to his advantage politically also. The other thing that's really interesting, sort of as a side note, Santa Ana had lost a leg um, during the war and he has a wooden leg that he, he attaches and he rides with his wooden leg and everything. And at night he takes his wooden leg off. Houston captures his wooden leg also. And the wooden leg will be, you know, kind of paraded through Texas separate from Santa Ana who's really ticked about that, which I, I find to be interesting. Santa Ana writes a number of letters protesting the indignity of being separated from his leg. But anyway, um, Sam Houston will force Santa Ana to recognize Texas independence. He will sign a document saying that he does. He will acknowledge that the Mexican army has to withdraw to south of the Rio Grande. And Santa Ana does. Now, the truth of the matter is over the next few years, the, the Mexican government will at times say, well, we only signed that agreement under duress, which truthfully is pretty much the only time that nations who've been defeated sign surrenders is usually under duress. I don't know that that's a good argument in an international tribunal court or anything, but you know, Mexico will be really, really annoyed. Almost immediately, Sam Houston and the leaders of the new government in the, the Republic of Texas will begin to talk about statehood. They want to become part of the United States. The United States, you know, if you think about it, 1835, 1836, 1836, Andrew Jackson is president. Jackson, we know, had encouraged Sam Houston uh, to, to serve in Texas. He had given him ideas about government. He, you know, there's a, there are a number of letters. None of them does Sam Houston ever incite revolution, but but Andrew Jackson does offer Sam Houston all kinds of political advice and everything. Jackson's not going to, because he will come out of power in early 1836, coming in as Martin Van Buren, you know, the old Knickerbocker from New York, um, Dutch, who's not interested in admitting Texas to the Union under any form at all. 
because he thinks that it will create a war with Mexico. Mexico basically has said, if you admit Texas to the United States, you are saying once and for all, you're taking our land and we will go to war with you. The other major point though, why the United States doesn't admit Texas to the war is that the Northern states, the anti-slavery, the abolitionist elements within Congress are really opposed because they look at Texas and they look at how large geographically Texas is and, and they do in their minds envision what happens if Texas divides into several states do we have enough territory in the north above that 3630 line that could come in to maintain the appropriate balance in Congress? So they just don't wanna deal with it. So for a period from 1836 until 1845, Texas sits as an independent, the Republic of Texas. You know, Van Buren serves one term only. Um, you will find that in 1840, William Henry Harrison, the old Tippecanoe and Tyler too, you know, the frontier warrior becomes president. He delivers his inaugural address and he's dead a month later, trying to prove how hell and hearty he is. He gives his speech in a snowstorm, one hour and 20 minutes of a speech with his coat off, takes pneumonia and dies. And John Tyler comes to the presidency and John Tyler, God love him, is a sweet Southern Virginian man, a Virginia man who has no desire to be president, doesn't, doesn't even really want to be a placeholder, but he's there. He does nothing. James K. Polk will campaign for the presidency as a dark horse. 1844 will be chosen as the Democratic candidate, uh, having been Speaker of the House, having been well liked and everything. And he will promise that if he's elected president, Texas will be admitted to the Union. He is elected in November of 1844. He will not take office until March. And by the time he takes office, John Tyler, who now can say, this is not my responsibility. James K. Polk's gonna do it anyway. We'll go ahead and get it through. Congress has set, in wheel and, uh, set the wheels in motion for Texas to come into the union and they will come in in 1845. Um, was the fear of war with Mexico valid? Well, certainly, we'll go to war with Mexico, you know, only two years later. Well, actually, 1846 to 1848, and ultimately we'll defeat them again. And out of that, of course, we'll get California, most of Arizona, and New Mexico will eventually, um, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1853, add another little stretch. We get parts of Colorado, Utah, Nevada. So, um, Was that an intention? There's nothing in Pope's writing that he really envisioned what the war would be, but he certainly was an expansionist president. He's the one who will bring the Oregon Territory into the Union also. You know, only four campaign promises and he fulfilled all four of them. So it is now 520 something another, and we have Texas coming into the Union in 1845, having been the Republic of Texas for a nine year period of time, which is why they can still fly that flag as high as the US flag, and why the Texans, you know, always, uh, you know, everything, the Texans always say everything in Texas is bigger and better, and you don't mess with Texas. Actually, by the way, don't mess with Texas was a litter campaign slogan in the 1970s. It had nothing to do with Texas, political or military power. It had to don't mess with Texas by, you know, making our beautiful landscape ugly, but it has somehow now become a political, you know, we'll punch you in the teeth kind of statement. That was not what it was originally intended for. So when you don't mess with Texas, don't throw your trash out the window. But don't, don't make them angry either because apparently they're all armed and dangerous even still. Not that that's not true for probably two thirds of Tennessee. But anyway, Texas is now part of the union in 1845. And of course, as we approach the American Civil War, Texas will play a, war, a role in the American Civil War because while many people around the world think of Texas as a Western state because they have this image of cowboys, you know, the stockades, you know, the cattle marches down the streets in Fort Worth, you know, cowboys, all of that, Texas really, politically and culturally was less a Western state and more of a Southern state because from whence it drew its, its roots and its ideas. So anyway, Texas is in the union. We can go outside and you know fly our flags or better yet throw a huge steak on the grill, <laughs> support those beef farmers, 
me and others and, you know, enjoy, you know, Texas is a wonderful place. I still love to visit Texas. There's nothing prettier than Fredericksburg and German Hill country and all the blue bonnets and, you know, so many of my family members have been stationed at one point or the other at Fort Hood and, you know, San Antonio is beautiful. Dallas, Fort Worth area. I think we need to rent that bus and plan for a trip someday soon. If not, I may just have to do it by myself. I'm if most I, enjoyed I, those days. Yes. If I'm have thoroughly enjoyed this, um, but I want to recommend a book. Oh, yay. Um, because this is what you were talking about in Texas, independence and everything. It's a really a fascinating period of our history. And James Michener, who is basically known as a novelist, wrote The Eagle and the Raven, which is a remarkable book about the, about the whole history between Santa Ana and Sam Houston. And it, it's, I've, it's been years since I've read it, but you're so right. It is an incredible book, yeah, incredible. Book. And um, to sort of bring it home, uh, my wife and I actually own a card table that belonged to Sam Houston. <gasps> yes. Uh, my great grandfather served as Texas governor in the in the years leading up to World War One, was president of the Texas Railroad Commission, among mm -hmm. other things. And uh, back in those days, when one governor would leave and another one would come in, apparently the basement of the of the governor's mansion was just a big dump for everything that people left behind. Oh, and be still my, my heart. <laughs> my great my great grandfather went down there and found this table that had belonged to Sam Houston and had it restored, brought it up, and it's been in my family ever since. And we and we restored it. And we just had it restored before we came to Chattanooga. Oh my gosh! Can I covet your family? There's my great grandfather in the governor's office. Oh my goodness! In in Texas. Oh, in Texas. What an incredible history! That's that's amazing. I'm I'm I can't decide whether to be envious or joyous or all of the above. No, but it was nice. It was interesting because yeah, the, originally the Colquitts came from Georgia. Camilla, again, Georgia. Yeah, of Scottish descent. You know, like you were saying. Yep, yeah, and and so made it to Texas. If you you it sounded like you had been to the Tex to the Texas Capitol. If you've been uh -huh. in the Capitol building, you know that in the rotunda. There's a portrait of all of those people who have served as governor. Yeah. The great granddad's portrait. You have to be so incredibly proud. Well, so yeah, it's, it's, it, I don't know what happened since then in terms of why the family <laughs> left politics, but. <laughs> well, you know, it, they may have hit that point where they were like, oh, for the love of heaven. We're going to go do something different. I but. do recommend Eagle and the Raven. I, it may oh. or may not be in the library's catalog. I, could, I didn't have a time to check, but it is, it's not a long book. Some of James Mitchell's books were real bricks. This is not, um, but it's a really fascinating history and it goes in depth into the relationship between those two men and it's just fascinating. Yeah, I mean, isn't it fascinating? And I, and I mean, what more can you do to humiliate someone than steal their wooden leg? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I just... But That's yeah. such a terrible thing to do, and yet it's really such a, such a coup d'etat. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, all of you need to read the the Raven and the uh, the Eagle and the Raven because it is yeah. fascinating the relationship between the two of them. And Sam Houston himself is fascinating. He really is. I see you all, to my friend. How are you? I have a question. Uh huh. Is he related to Rusty Colquitt? Is is the other observer? Yeah. Are you related to, to I, Rust, a guy by the name of Rusty Colquitt? I honestly don't know, but Col the Colquitt name doesn't. It's not a huge family. No. Um, so somewhere back there, there is probably common ancestry somewhere. It's not somebody you went to school with. Well, Rusty was a Navy guy here in Chattanooga. Yeah. Might love well, him. I think maybe we do SAR papers or something. We find that out. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is an unusual name. I haven't seen it very often as much research as I do genealogically and everything. That's an unusual name. That's just yes. fascinating. I have have you in lived in Texas? Excuse me? Have you lived in Texas? I have not. No, I grew, up, they, they I, in Texas. I grew up on the West I wasn't Coast. born there, but I got there as soon as I could. I was about five months old. My dad went to Baylor College of Medicine. And taught. and taught 
gross and comparative anatomy at Baylor College of Medicine. Wow. Wow. And, and me and my brothers, we were raised in Houston area, around right. Bel Air. Around San Jacinto. Where every well, there was a high school named yeah. San, Je San Jacinto. <laughs> San Jacinto, the way Texans would say it. And every major street in, in Houston, the only three- Is named names, after the every, heroes. Everybody you named, Fannin. Travis. <laughs> oh my gosh. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, they take great. their history very seriously. Great, oh, yes. Great hour, Linda. Thank you. Oh, uh, listen, the history is just so fascinating. I'm, don't you all think we'd have great fun on a bus trip? Just think all that we would learn about oh, yes. each other while we were traveling together. I'm ready. We need to put the Cottonwood Inn in LaGrange, Texas on your list. Uh, and I have to go to the Minger. I always have to go to the bar in the Minger, not because I'm a drinker, but because Teddy Roosevelt recruited the Rough Riders there. Uh, and then yeah. that gives me an excuse to go to the Alamo. The bus <laughs> trip needs to be in early April because that's when the blue bonnets are coming out. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, I there's deep nothing deep. prettier than blue bonnets. I'm telling you, I can be packed in 20 minutes, people. You all think I'm lying, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm a low maintenance girl. <laughs> and all I need are jeans and t-shirts and boots and, and yep. journals so that I can write about what we see. And a sun visor. And yep. a sun visor, that's <laughs> true. Okay. Something that will look pretty as I'm seated in the midst of a blue bonnet field, which is <laughs> what I've we used to be notorious when Raz was at Texas A&M in law school to, you know, be there in the spring when the blue bonnets were blooming and check both directions, pull over to the side and run, sit in the middle of them and get pictures. Yeah, my, my brother was a graduate of Texas A&M. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, I knew we were all connected. Well, was I know he was an Aggie. He was, uh -huh. a, he was a Baylor Dental and he was an Ohio State. He gets to choose. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, Suzette, we're running over our time, I know, but now we're reminiscing. We're just, we're planning that bus trip. I'm thinking maybe if we had a good 16 passenger van, we can <laughs> draw numbers and then we can all be cozy. Cozy, very cozy. <laughs> could I ask you one question? You, 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 sure mentioned the, you mentioned the Bugalo and that they were going to kill everyone. Was that a long-standing history of the Spanish conquest and military conquest in, 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 in the Americas? They didn't always use it, but the Spanish used it more than did any of the other European cultures because within the French and the English, I think there's that common commonality of chivalry from the times of Richard the Lionhearted and Philip Augusta yeah. and some of the others. The Spanish would use it occasionally but had not used it apparently in decades prior to him using it at the Alamo. And, and it's interesting because I've often wondered if the men who heard it knew the significance or if it only did the, the Mexican army understand the significance. Hmm. But it apparently is a tone that's blown that you know, just means everyone will die. You know, it's kind of like Grant at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson saying unconditional surrender. You know, we're not going to let them keep their guns. We're not going to let them keep anything. This is unconditional surrender, um, except we didn't shoot everybody. I mean, that's, that's, and then for it to happen again at Goliad under a white flag, I mean, that's just, for those of us who have studied military history and who, who hold to the rules of engagement. And I mean, it, it, I always think it's so ironic to talk about warfare and rules of engagement simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. But under rules of engagement, you just don't do that. You yeah. just don't no. do that. Why? That's a pirate victory. That's a, it's a horrendous precedent to say it. It's just, awful. just and, awful. And it's amazing how that whole history of some chivalry of, of taking survivors then evolves into the modern world warfare with bombing, with firebombing Tokyo, and you know where we kind of almost it's like everybody is a potential casualty of war, and it's like you you kill until the opponent doesn't fight back. So it's and that it's, you uh, and I I will I have had folks in war college classes say that because of modern warfare there really is no distinction between any longer military no. and civilian. 
that it is all one. And I mean, that's when you think about that, that's a totally different way of looking at warfare because then you're, yeah. if, you're, if you're waging warfare to break the will of the people, then the civilian population are your most vulnerable yeah. ta target. Well, that, well, that's what that's so stunning. What he was doing as dictator to basically declare out and out, you know, you either you either comply or you die is kind of a stunning dictator approach, even even for the you know, 1830s. I mean, that's amazing. even for the 1830s. It's just insane. It's like, how do you think you're going to survive with that approach? <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm, I'm more of the consensus kind of person. There's got to be yeah. something we can all meet. <laughs> We don't need to kill each other. Well, I know that you all are headed off to do yeah. other things. It's 541. Thank you.